I also wanted to ask you, doctor, about gluten. Uh, I mean, you know, a lot of celebrities talk about gluten-free diets and a lot of people emulate them. But very few people actually know what gluten is and how, uh, you know, it can be beneficial uh, for people who go gluten-free, but also about celiac disease and all of that. Yeah, so basically, you know, gluten is the stuff which makes our wheat more chewy, right? Fundamentally, so gluten's from wheat. And look, there's also, from an evolutionary biology perspective, parts of the world where people are more intolerant to certain things, right? So, so if you look at, in India, in the south, they were mostly rice eating, and in the north, they were mostly wheat eating, right? So in wheat eating populations, there is a percentage of gluten intolerance. In America, it's, I think, 1 in 133 people or something like that, right? Now, nowadays, of course, we can test people genetically. So there are two parts to the gluten intolerance. So one is the full-blown celiac, which is like you're completely intolerant to gluten, so which is more an, like an almost an immune system reaction, which means your body is intolerant to it. So it's recognizing that it's something foreign. So it's literally giving you immune response so you're getting pretty bad side effects from it and you're getting almost like an autoimmune disease and that's quite serious so that's the celiac end but till recently even till 10-15 years ago in medicine we didn't recognize there's another variant which is just gluten sensitivity so it's not as bad as a full-blown celiac but you just still don't tolerate it well so it affects your digestion and generally can affect your skin and so on and so forth so now we know genetically that we can test people and we know that some people have extreme end and some people have. So for those people, we actually have an algorithm which rates them from mild, medium, high gluten intolerance. So if you are at medium and high, of course, you want to avoid gluten. If you are the mild end now and then you'll get away with it. If you're not intolerant at all, you're fine. But it generally find you find it in populations so it's much more uncommon in the south of india a little bit more common again not common common probably one five hundred whatever a little bit more in the north but it's still not as common as people think it is but that's just because uh it just people are talking about it and the celebrities where everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon it's still like your high protein thing you mentioned right for a small number of people it is a real thing it's the same thing in asia particularly dairy farming came out of the Middle East and then it went to Europe. So it was first done around um, Middle East kind of area. So you generally find very low lactose intolerance there. But in Asia, people were mostly hunter-gatherers, particularly even you go further out east in Asia. So if you go Korea, Japan, all those places, literally all adults are uh, lactose intolerant, right? So even in our kind of population in India, maybe as adults, there may be over 50% of people develop lactose intolerance. And that's what it's I say. It's surprising. Yeah. So yeah. that's what I mean. So as because we've then incorporated those practices from other, inherently we weren't doing it, right? So it just means that that's why as an adult, just milk isn't particularly anything good for you, but it's more the myth around it, right? Can you give us some tips or uh, some do's and don'ts for pregnant women? I think the most important thing is obviously which doctors themselves nowadays to reduce the risk of birth defects and things, give them a set of vitamins, you know, like folic acid and toxin, various things which are beneficial. Like I said, in darker skin like us, we actually have a lower rate of infertility as well as a lower rate of birth defects compared to uh, Western populations. I think the only other thing I would say is the second trimester like I was surprised in recent research that women's diet in the second trimester, particularly as a bearing. Um, so, for example, your omega-3 content in your second trimester, like women who had didn't have omega-3 enough in their diet in the second trimester had something like a 40% higher chance of having an autism spectrum child or uh, ADHD. So I think from that point of view, diet is important. And during pregnancy, of course, you want to consume enough calories because you're feeding more than one person, but also the type of calories you're getting, it's enough, to, enough omega-3 uh, is important. So I think the reality is 
as with anything else, pregnancy or otherwise, we do consume too many calories. Like I find like when I travel to India and travel to other countries, particularly in India, I find in middle age, for example, I'm speaking for men when I'm meeting them, generally seem to be the most unfit of anywhere, right? Because they're overeating, over drinking, not enough exercise, right? Everyone watches a lot of sport rather than does anything, right? I don't mean it in a bad way, but the truth is that everyone does so much time. Like I watch very little TV. I eat no junk food, but I go there, everyone's watching a lot of TV, They're eating a lot of junk food while watching TV, right? <laughs> so so I think it's, it's that. So the reality is um, that whole thing then translate over to the psyche of, you know, more food is good for you kind of thing. Maybe the origins were when malnourished, when, when, you, were mal when you suddenly became prosperous, you had enough food, so you over it. But I think now, we're matured enough as a population that I think we can achieve some middle ground. I mean, also previously, we didn't have such sedentary lifestyles as well. Right? We mm. were and it's getting moving. worse, right? Yeah. And, and now yeah. it's getting worse because children are spending so much time on the devices as they're more inside and they're less active, even from a school point of view and all that. So I think, yeah, definitely. And that brings me you know, to the question of cosmetics. Uh, especially makeup and I think I've seen a rise in the utilization of makeup not only in India but all over the world um, you also have a line of your not cosmetics but uh, skin care hmm. right yeah so generally my focus is literally on because I'm a skin cancer doctor on sunscreens and we have tinted version um, and we have a plain version it comes out of my research lab, it's called the Healthy Skin Lab. We also make um, a no-tox kind of a range, which is a more um, natural ingredient alternative to using injectables and fillers and things like that. But I think, look, largely most of it is driven by the media and the fact that people are looking to celebrities and whatever they sell literally takes off kind of stuff, right? So I think if you're asking me, do you definitely need makeup no you don't if you're asking me what is it that you definitely don't need if you're asking me from a skincare point of view saying cleansing toning you know people say definitely toner is something you don't really need i mean the reality is obviously you want to clean your face especially if you've got impurities you're exposed to pollution things like that and then the more ph neutral it is closer to your skin ph the better literally like in the democracy book you've got it's actually got recipes for your um, uh, you'll see your cleansers and toners.